Welcome to USC. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kirsten Olson. I'm with the Unruh Institute of Politics, and we have a great lunch event planned for you all, so we hope you enjoy it. We hope you enjoy your visit to USC as well. I'll begin by introducing our panelists, and then we will go um, forward with the conversation. Just to give you a sense of the format of today's event, for the first 30 minutes or so, Sarah and I will take turns asking questions of our panelists, our two distinguished panelists, and then we will turn it over to you all and give you all a, a choice of asking a question of either of our panelists. Sound good? Okay. So just to introduce our uh, distinguished panelists, I will begin with introducing to you Sarah Donapatana, who is seated to my left. Sarah is the news editor of the USC Daily Trojan, the campus newspaper. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Donapatana. To my right uh, is a very distinguished uh, guest. We're very privileged that he's with us here today, Professor Bob Shrum. He currently serves as the USC Dornsif Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Chair in Practical Politics. Uh, pr prior to that role, he was a veteran political consultant who worked on eight presidential campaigns and navigated 30 winning Senate campaigns and eight winning gubernatorial campaigns. Join me in welcoming Bob Shrum. And to his right is our friend John Wilcox, also a very distinguished guest who we're very proud to have with us here today. Uh, John was the lead... This, this won't take as long. <laughs> John was the lead speechwriter for Governor Pete Wilson, the former governor of California. Prior to that, he served as the communications director for U.S. Representative Daryl Issa for his gubernatorial campaign, and currently serves as the president of Multiplicity Media, a strategic communications consulting firm here in Los Angeles. Join me in welcoming John Wilcox. So the topic of today's lunch is the 2016 presidential race. And so I'm sure some of you have heard of some of the candidates who have expressed interest in running for president in 2016. We'll hopefully go through a few of those name by name throughout the conversation. But we think we'd like to start off the conversation just by discovering and maybe exploring a little bit about the fact that it is April 2015, <laughs> and we are already talking about the presidential race that will be determined in November of 2016. So my first question is to you, Bob, and then to you, John. To what extent is it a good thing or is it a bad thing for candidates to be announcing or talking about their plans this early and essentially be running a campaign that lasts over 16 months? First, let me say it's a privilege to be here with all of you. Uh, I think it's wonderful that you have some interest in politics. I hope it grows over time. Uh, when I was your age, which was an eon ago, uh, I actually volunteered for uh, John F. Kennedy at the 1960 Democratic Convention and worked for Pierre Salinger, the con who was his press secretary. That was right across con the street, right across the street. Convention was here in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, in any event, uh, Look, when JFK announced in 1960, he announced on January 3rd of that year, and the press wrote about how unprecedented it was to announce that early. Uh, ever since then, people have been announcing earlier and earlier and earlier. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's an inevitable thing. It's inevitable for several reasons. First there's the amount of money you now have to raise in politics. Uh, Barack Obama raised a billion dollars in 2012, and uh, Romney, to be fair, came fairly close. I don't think they spent it as efficiently, but Romney raised a lot of money. And so you need a long lead time. You need a long runway. Uh, you get Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, especially, who are out there right now. They had to announce to begin to raise the money because they can't do what Jeb Bush is doing. Jeb Bush is using super PACs where he can get a lot of people to put, a lot of big donors, to put in a lot of money right away. Uh, I don't know, my friend George Will would say, um, we are friends, although we agree on almost nothing. Uh, <laughs> my friend George Will would say, you know, this is the most powerful country in the world. The stakes are very high. And what's wrong with spending 16 or 18 months or, you know, 24 months uh, trying to talk about this and think about it. It doesn't mean we spend all our time on it. We look in, 
Uh, and the candidates themselves, especially given Iowa and New Hampshire, and the demands that are now made there, have to go and move there for significant periods of time and stand in people's living rooms and someone who could be the next president of the United States is answering questions from 15 people at a house party. <laughs> John, to what extent is it a good idea or a bad idea for candidates to be declaring their candidacy this early? I'll steal a little bit from what Bob said, which is the, the fact is whether it's good or bad, it's inevitable. But to me, it's very modern as well. You know the past year's primary structure from the, you know, the 1960 election or 68 or th these past years, there were far fewer primaries. There were far fewer elections. Far fewer people got to vote to nominate, forget elect, nominate an individual. These were mostly covered by the parties. In some ways, I think it was efficient, but obviously there was a lot less of what we consider to be core democracy. If you lived in a certain state, you wouldn't get to vote. If you lived in another state, you would get to choose. So what we have now is obviously something that is very large and um, very institutionalized. What I mean by that, it's gonna go on and even get more so. Um, the primary election obviously begins in Iowa with great tradition. It then goes to New Hampshire. It then goes to South Carolina, and then it's kind of a mix from there. <laughs> but one I would say is rather, I don't have any, I don't have any, um, it's never been something I was interested in to say there was too much politics or too much voting or too much media, my view is they're trying to get your attention. And somewhat unsuccessfully, <laughs> one would argue, but at the same time, that's the core rationale of this. It's the core reasoning of this. And um, it can be messy, it can be a little sloppy, it can turn you off, obviously. But at the same time, um, if you consider the alternative, this is the only kind of system that I think would ever work. So over the course of the past few months, uh, more than a dozen Democrat and Republican um, Republicans have uh, publicly announced their interest to run for presidency in 2016. Even this early on prior to the primary elections, there are certainly candidates who have proven to display significantly higher popularity rankings among the voters. Among the Democrats, it seems that former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, has ha garnered f high favorability rankings, and amongst most Republicans, it seems that Jeb Bush has gained more popularity than other candidates. Uh, what candidates from both sides should the voters expect to run for presidency, and I guess what are your predictions in terms of outcome? Um, to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it at the same time. No. I'll, do, I'll do the Democrats first, because that's easier. And then after, he does the then, then after he does the Republicans, I'll come back and tell you what I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, them. Uh, barring an unexpected and unforeseen event or a colossal error, Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. Uh, who else will run? Uh, former Governor Martin O'Malley of Maryland wants to run, is going to run, I think. He's going to make a generational argument saying he's young, she's not, it's time to move on to new leadership. You know, listening to my own students, I don't think that argument has a lot of traction, especially among young women. They do not see Hillary Clinton as some kind of throwback to the past. And I think in the Democratic Party, <coughs> she's very strong. Jim Webb, the former senator from Virginia, interesting guy, uh, quixotic, idiosyncratic, I'm looking for the right word. <laughs> I don't know what he'll run on if he runs. Uh, and finally, there's Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont, who's an independent, former socialist, uh, who if he runs, will run in the Democratic Party. He actually has something to say. He wants to talk about income maldistribution, about the need for a fairer society, about the need for some basic changes. Uh, I don't think if he runs, he'll run with the illusion that he's gonna be the nominee, but he'll run in the belief that he can have an impact on the process, on the party, on where it stands, and on what Hillary Clinton says. And of course, you should always turn off your cell phone before you start doing an event like this. I was gonna call you, but I'm sorry. Um, let me continue with that. Uh, quickly on the Republican side, let me just say this. Well, quick on the Democrat side, is one thing that you have to think about, Hillary Clinton is obviously a major figure. Everybody knows who she is, and she's been around a long time. Um, Bob alluded to it, but one thing I want to let you know, that if she runs, well, when she runs and how she does, 
she'll be one of the oldest people ever to run for the presidency at this level. If she's elected, she'd be the second oldest person ever elected, and yet doesn't seem that old. I think mean, 68 is the new well, well, 40. Ronald Reagan was the <laughs> oldest, and he was elected with support, enormous support from young people. This is true. But so the idea that there's a translation between the candidate's age and the voter's decision is, is dubious at best. Oh, it's totally true. And one of the, so the, the point I'm making is that it shows one thing to say that, and Reagan's age was an issue when he was running. I don't know if Hillary Clinton's age is going to be, but the point is, you know, she's 67 or 68. She doesn't act it, doesn't look it. So to me, age is different for young people and for old people than it was. The other Republican side, the one thing I'm interested to say is that the number of candidates who might be involved or who are going to run, who have been elected and become prominent since Obama became president, with the exception of Jeb Bush, who's been around a long time, almost 20 years, almost every other major candidate has been elected either governor of their state or to the Senate since Obama was elected. This is a, see, these are very new faces. Mm -hmm. They have not been in office very long. In some ways, it's the Obama model. Obama himself was elected to the Senate in 2004, and four years later, he's president of the United States. So to me, the time is very different. So I think that the candidates we, that you see right now, you said that Jeb Bush is very popular. Well, I mean, I think that you know it's very much now of a name ID issue and the people who are really paying attention. My point is, on these polls, I always think, I always want to be other. My name is Wilcox, but if I was, if I was other, I'd always be ahead in the polls, you know, because it's somebody other. The point I'm making is that right now, it's the ones that we are known. I think there are some candidates, like a Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin, who was known to, you know, several hundred thousand Republicans who really follow this and who really care about this. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but the point is, he is somebody who is known to people outside of Wisconsin. Republican at the time, people who like his politics, have heard about him, maybe even supported him. So to me, you're seeing more, my point is, there are many now politicians who represent one state, say like with Walker in Wisconsin, but he has supporters from all over the country, monetary supporters. So to me, that's been a big factor going forward. Could I, could I do one thing, one way to think about this, and I'd be interested if you agree, the Republican Party has, ever since Barry Goldwater at least, always nominated the next person in line, the person they're supposed to nominate next. That's Jeb Bush. And he is the establishment choice. He is going to raise an enormous amount of money. There is real resistance to him among a lot of Republican grassroots for a variety of reasons. His position on immigration uh, reform, his position on the Education Common Core Standard, and not least his brother. Uh, but it's gotten tougher and tougher with each cycle for the establishment to impose its choice. Their fallback choice this time, I think, is Scott Walker. Uh, he's a little untested. Uh, he appeared on Meet the Press to suggest that we should send troops into Syria a couple months ago. He's going to have to get better than that if he's going to succeed. But I do not rule out the Republican Party nominating one of the other candidates, one of the insurgents. Uh, I think it could actually happen this time. Although if Rand Paul, who declared yesterday and then got in a fight with Savannah Guthrie on today this morning and then got in a fight with the Associated Press this afternoon, uh, he's going to have to learn to somehow or other smooth things out. Uh, but I think one of those guys could win. But the way to think about it is the establishment versus the insurgents. Uh, the establishment always prevails. I guess I just want to, I guess I agree partly, but I'll just say something else. I think it's going to come down mostly to candidate quality. I mean, first of all, Hillary Clinton is probably the most establishment candidate that has ever lived in ever. So I think that that's one reason why she's got so much support. But I'll make another point. We talk about the establishment. And Bob's point is fair. What he means by that is, you know, the guy who you think is going to win. You know, the guy who you, well, if I had to pick today, I guess I'd choose him or her. That's what we mean by the establishment. And that candidate has usually, or almost always, been chosen. But look at the same time. Romney, in 2012, he was, by any measure, the best candidate who ran for office on the Republican side. I mean, it wasn't even close. The best, the one who was going to do the best, the one who raised the most money, the one who was the most consistent, the one who performed the best. I'd make the same point about, I think that their Democrats are on a, are on a huge establishment poll. John Kerry was by far far the, hot, the best performing candidate in 2004. Al Gore was obviously the establishment choice in 2000. 
Michael Dukakis was the establishment choice. Walter Mondale was the establishment choice. So to me, I think the establishment is the one that has a great pull. It's not unlike, honestly, recruiting. USC is an establishment football program. I think it's the best by far and away. <laughs> why anybody would go anywhere else surprises me. But the point I'm making is one reason why USC has success in getting the best students and the best athletes and the best student athletes to attend here is because we have a great reputation. Candidates are a little bit like that. I very much concur with your remarks at the conclusion, I Mr. Wilcox. I finally got Kirsten to agree with something that I said. <laughs> So moving on to another aspect of this conversation, I'd like to just query our audience here very briefly. How many of you are uh, voting age or 18 years old? Okay, of those, how many of you are registered to vote? Excellent, okay. But we could I, do I, better. I brought, I brought some I, but we can do Bob, better. Bob and I brought some paperwork uh, for you. Yeah. To <laughs> um, no matter who the candidates are, and after they choose their running mates and they have an established candidacy and an established platform, they're going to have to turn their focus to voter turnout. Of course, President Obama was excellent at uh, targeting millennials and young people. To what extent do you think the next two candidates on both sides will target that same voter group, young folks, millennials, or to what extent will they target other folks? Well, Democrats are going to focus a lot on millennials, a lot on single women, a lot on Hispanic voters and other minorities. Uh, and there's going to be a major effort with Hillary Clinton to try to improve democratic performance among uh, uh, white men uh, and married white women. But let me say something about this because it's the new, new thing on the block. Everybody talks about Twitter, social media, the Obama operation, turning everybody out really mobilizing folks. I think it all works if you have something to say. Without message, it doesn't matter. There was a guy who was running for re-election to the Senate in Colorado last year named Udall, and they replicated at a cost of $60 million, I think, much of the Obama communication structure, uh, the social media, the turnout, all of that. It didn't work because he lost the message war to Cory Gardner. And one thing you have to understand when all these people say we're building our social media platform, we're hiring our social media experts, as, as the best of them would tell you, if you don't have a compelling argument to make to voters, it doesn't matter. I mean, Marshall McLuhan, someone you guys probably never heard of, was, once came up with a line saying the medium is the message. It's not true. The medium doesn't work without the message. I really want to uh, second. I just want to tell you in the back, you've missed so much. I can hardly even, I mean, I, I appreciate you coming, but it's been so great so far. Um, let me make one point, you know, from what Bob said. I really, want to, I really want to endorse that, but I want to maybe make one point. I think Obama isn't a, yeah, I'm not a political supporter, but that is one attractive, engaging individual, the way he talks, the way he looks, the way he, you know, obviously you hang around a long time, people get to know you, it's not as exciting. But I'll make a point of turnout. You know, Barack Obama was reelected with fewer votes than he was elected. And that has not happened in 80 years. So I want to credit some way of connecting and getting people to turn out. I think there's some, some mythology that he's overwhelmingly popular. He's a lot less popular than he was in the beginning. He, he, but his team, he and his team deserve enormous credit for the mechanics of how they got people to vote for him, as well as the fact that he himself is a hell of a candidate. But there's another reality that has been declining sharply and more than slowly for a while. But the point is, I want to say that to endorse what Bob said is, look, if you're not interesting and you're not engaging and you're not connecting, it doesn't matter how many times I tweet you, it doesn't matter how many times I want to friend you or link to you or you know, we want to do a Snapchat, it isn't going to work. So to me, the core, the core of how this is going really does come down to the campaigns and the candidates and how they connect. And for campaigns, it's so different. You know, we're not selling Dr. Pepper or beer. You know, there's an interesting point that, you know, beer, all the beer advertising helps beer, period. All kinds of beer. But I would say that look at the commercials. You know, my mom's old enough to drink beer, but I never see her in a commercial. <laughs> Looks more like you. Maybe you in a couple years. My point is, that's who they're trying to get, and that, that's a turnout model as well. So to me, campaigns are trying to do the same thing. Right. 
All right, so I'm gonna move on this next question to Professor Shrum. History shows us that it's extremely likely that candidates, presidential candidates, are going to utilize negative campaign strategies towards their opponents. For example, recently, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was involved in a email scandal uh, where she was targeted for using her federal email for personal matters. And many believe that the scandal was released by the Republican Party. Which crisis communication strategies should candidates take into consideration when facing large national scandals? Well, let me say three things. One, uh, negative advertising uh, and negative attacks are here to stay. They've always been here, by the way. I mean, the Jefferson uh, Adams campaign in 1800 was no model of high-minded civic engagement. There was an awful lot of, they each, each party then owned newspapers. And, printed the most outrageous things about the other party. It's here to stay, but it works if it's relevant to voters' lives. So for example, I mean, I think Mitt Romney in 2012 wanted the campaign to be a referendum on the last four years. You know, are you really happy? Don't you think we could do a little bit better? And the Obama people won the message war because they made it a choice. Who's on your side? Who's gonna stand up for you? And the negative ads that were run uh, especially the Bain ads. The Bain was a company that, that Romney had been very involved in, had helped make a lot of his money, took over some companies, you can argue about it, closed some of them down, people lost their health insurance, all that. Those ads were brutally effective. I don't understand, by the way, that was the campaign we ran for Senator Kennedy against Romney when he ran for the Senate in 1994. And he had 18 years to get ready for the attacks, and he didn't seem to be ready for them. So 18 that's... years from now, though, you, you're really going to be impressed. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it, so the attack has to be relevant. It has to matter either to people's lives or to their values for it to be important. Uh, that's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make is, and I'm not in the business of giving the Republican Party advice, nor would they take it from me, uh, but I think this obsession with attacking Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton for not being transparent enough, whatever that means, uh, for the, e the email thing. I, I just think this plays to the base of the Republican Party. It doesn't play to the swing voters <coughs> who in the end are gonna determine the election. I mean, what are you gonna vote on? Your kid's chance to go to college or Hillary Clinton's email system? Uh, I, I just don't think it's relevant, but I think there's a tremendous appetite for it in some parts of the Republican Party. I think it's a big mistake. I think the great Republican challenge, and there will be negative ads on both sides, but the great Republican challenge is to go out there and set out a vision for the future and where they want to take the country. Finally, having said that, let me say that I thought the way that Hillary Clinton handled this was a model of how not to do crisis communication. Uh, it took her a week to answer. Uh, she did it in a very stilted press conference at the United Nations in front of a tapestry of uh, Picasso's Guernica, which is a great piece of anti-war art, but not exactly the background you'd pick for this. Uh, and she should have been out there right away. She should have said something like, in my view, look, it was a mistake. I didn't realize it was a mistake. I was leaving the Senate, transitioning, was gonna go to the State Department. And uh, my husband had an email system that it seemed that I could use. I used it. No one ever told me I couldn't use it. But I should have been told, and I shouldn't have used it. End of story. A lot better than saying I wanted to protect the privacy of Chelsea's wedding plans or my yoga lessons. Uh, I, I just think it, was, it wasn't done right, it wasn't done fast enough, and it wasn't forthright enough. Uh, John Lindsay got reelected mayor of New York someone you've never heard of, but who actually probably saved the city from burning in the, in the 1960s. But he got reelected because there had been a huge snowstorm in Queens that people thought had done him in forever because Queens didn't get cleaned up for five days and people couldn't get to work or anything. He opened his reelection campaign with a commercial that said, we didn't clean up the snow in Queens as fast as we should have, and that was a mistake. And that opened the door for people to look beyond that and decide on other factors. So she should have been more forthright and she should have been a lot faster and I assume she will be in the future. 
And Mr. Wilcox, can you talk a little bit about that? Could, could you repeat the question? No. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> let me, let me uh, address the point about really quickly and maybe not make a correction. The, the Clinton email story was broken by the New York Times. Right. It was not broken by the Republican Party, so I guess I want to correct that. Second thing I want to say is Bob's point about how quickly she should have responded. Well, my view is it took her that long to get her story straight and to make up this absurd excuse about yoga pants, Chelsea, and her mother's funeral. I knew so, we'd get partisan here. Well, but to me, I mean, but, that, I mean, but that's obvious. And the second thing is she actually had the opportunity. When, in my, in my, it, it seems to me in my experience, if you have a scandal that breaks or, the, or something that's you know, difficult to deal with, you don't get seven days to make up your mind. Nobody came to her house. Nobody came to her office. Nobody came to the other people's office. So to me, she had a lot of time and tried to pull this off. But to me, to the point about negative advertising, I will support what Bob says in the sense that it's not going to work if it's not you know, relevant or, or somewhat believable. But I'll make another point about elections. Elections are not beauty contests, thank goodness. <laughs> And they're not, you know, like in the Olympics with the gymnastics, you know, the, the judges, you know, 7.9. They're not that. <laughs> and they're not, you know, where the theater critic says, well, I like the beginning, the music, but I don't know the plot, and another, but it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. We don't do that either. Elections are choices. That's it. And not choices like eh, Chipotle or Fat Burger. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good choice. They are, they are what we call binary choices, one or two. Coke or Pepsi, not Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper. That is not involved. You get one or two choices. That's all you get. Plain or peanut. That's all you get. And so to me, that is consistent with why you have the negative advertising to have the comparative. So to me, it's not, and if you don't get more than half of the market, you go broke and you lose. So to me, what's interesting for you to think about elections is the extent to which they are totally unlike anything else and that they're most stark choices that anybody can make, one or the other and no other. So at this point, I just want to let you all know that I'm going to ask one final question of both of our panelists, and then we're going to turn it over to all of you to ask your questions of our panelists. So for the next few moments, start thinking about some of the things you would like to ask them. But I will ask one final question, which is talking about the narratives and the themes we're going to see in 2016. Of course, President Obama ran on a very... Uh, solid hope and change message, wanted to change the way Washington does business, wanted to change the way a lot of folks perceive politics. But yet this, and as an example, this morning I watched a press conference with Rand Paul and he's standing behind a podium that said on the placard on the podium, defeat the Washington machine, unleash the American dream. So what do you think that we will see on both sides as the overarching narrative of the message of the campaigns? I, think, I was going to use machine today, but no, you, you stole it from me. I think, I think curiously, uh, both sides are going to try to talk about income inequality uh, and the fact that wages have been held down and have not, not advanced. People, the, the economy is recovering, but people are not recovering as fast as they should or did in previous economic periods. I think they'll talk about it in very different ways. I think Hillary Clinton will run... I don't, I'm not going to say this is the slogan because it's been used before, but she'll run on something like, I'm on your side, I'm out there fighting for you, and she'll have some specifics. If she doesn't, she's going to be in big trouble. In 2008, she ran a campaign of restoration in a year of change. She ran a campaign of experience in a year when people were sick of the experience that they saw around them in Washington. Barack Obama perfectly connected with the electorate because he ran on change in a year of change. Her challenge, and by the way, she is change by the very nature of who she is. She would be the first woman president of the United States. But she's going to have to go out there and say, I have a vision for the country. Here's my vision. I think it will center around, and the economy is always fundamental in these elections. Foreign policy will be part of this. The economy will be fundamental. And I think it will, her message will center around fighting for you, fighting for a higher minimum wage, fighting for lowering college costs. I mean, you fill in the blank. If she doesn't do that, she's in big trouble. I think, as I said earlier at the beginning of this program, that the Republican challenge, and oddly, I think someone we haven't mentioned named Marco Rubio may do pretty well at this. The Republican challenge is going to be to go out there 
and articulate a message that goes beyond no, no, no to here's how we want to change the country and make your lives better. Bob makes an excellent point, and I think that the, the one way to look at it is I'm interested to the extent to which we have this, uh, you know, the, pre the presence of Barack Obama will be involved in this election. Obviously, he's not going to be on the ballot, but you have a, you know, he's been president for eight years, and so that to a certain extent, you know, Hillary Clinton supporters have to want to continue something, so she'll run, you know, somewhat in concert with that, but at the same time, it won't be exactly you know, four more years, but so that's a, that's a difficult position, but you know, one that she's totally ready for, and I know that they're thinking about it, and I'm sure that they'll execute it. In the same time, Bob makes another good point, which is Republicans obviously, you know, have been out of power now for eight years, have not had the White House, so they're not happy about that, and they want to be given the opportunity to go back, so the voters have to give it to them. And in the past two elections, that hasn't happened. So they themselves have to make the choice or figure out the balance between how the, the extent to which things now aren't good enough or have to be changed or stronger language than that, but at the same time be somebody or a couple of somebodies who the voters can feel good about, not just feel um, angry towards something else and want to put them in. So to me the challenges really for both are, are out there and um, it's unclear how they can really handle it. But uh, to me, I expect that those will be the main challenges with all the other aspects of the campaign and trying to appeal to the voters in that way. Great. So now we're going to open um, the panel to you guys, I guess, the discussion to you guys. And you guys have a chance to ask some of your own questions. Um, so I have two things to remind you guys about. The first one is to direct your question to a specific panelist. And the second one is the fact that we can all disagree to be without being disagreeable. So please be respectful and polite um, of your colleagues and your classmates' opinions. All right. So we can... um, this question goes to Jonathan Wilscott. It's because I put the name here, you yes. see. Bob, this is the total <laughs> message delivery. You said, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, if you were to run for presidency, what would you change, and who would you, who would you aim the voters to oh, be? I have been waiting for that question all my life, <laughs> and um, it's not too late for me. Um, I think I'm, you know, young at heart, but a lot of experience. I feel like I'm appealing now to the to the young vote, and I have uh, my senior counselor, so I think there ain't no stop me now. Uh, I'm older than Hillary Clinton, so obviously I can't run. Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, it's a, uh, I have to say, those are the, I don't want to be surprised, those are the last 27 words I ever expected anybody would ever ask me. Um, but I'll, I'll make it, you know, let me, add, let me make this point. The, the one thing that I've seen in, in my you, career, which is really, had, even though I'm only 31, has been going on for 24 years, and Bob has been there longer, is I will say this, more people are more unhappy, more disagreeable, and more distant from politics, politicians, and the political system than any time I've seen before. And that takes various roles and levels. So to me, the great candidate going forward is gonna have to be inspiring, but at the same time, be authentic. The BS meter of this room is off the charts. What I mean by that, it's, it's harder to manipulate, I'm being serious, it's harder to manipulate you than it was to manipulate me when I sat in this chair. You've seen more, you know more. I mean, I would like to tell you one thing and get you on my side, but honestly, it's not gonna work. Maybe two things, but the, the, point, the, the ultimate point is, the kind of person running for president, I think, is gonna try to break through and balance. Every, can, every campaign has a glorious vision where they're gonna run a different kind of campaign, and they're gonna roll up their sleeves, and I'm gonna take off my tie, and I'm gonna try some other shoes. And I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna, you know, use Snapchat. And everybody's gonna love it. And then what do they do? They run the kind of the same ads and mail and the same kind of speeches and the same kind of, you know, dark blue suits. So to me, honestly, the next candidate, and it can be an older person, it can be a younger person, it can be a Democrat or Republican, it can be a man or woman, who I think speaks to that, 
speaks to people who, who find that there is more wrong and more missing than, than, they, than they not just like or remember or can see. That's the kind of campaign that I think is going to be great. Not just, you know, huge inspiration, that's part of it. But to me, to break loose and break free from what's obviously holding so many voters back, and it's both the party's responsibility. All right, any other questions from the audience? All right, we have one in the back. I can, I can do my re-election is the next question, I think. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Nathaniel. My question is, um, which candidate do you think is going to fare better, Hillary Clinton, who will come out of primary season with very little challengers, or the prospective establishment candidate in Jeb Bush, or whoever it may be, uh, that comes out of the primary season having debated up to 20 candidates uh, from all across the GOP spectrum? I think, <clears throat> I think you could argue this either way. The uh, question is, Hillary better off if she doesn't have a serious challenge, or is the Republican better off? whether it's Bush or somebody else, because they have to go through the gauntlet. The, for Hillary Clinton, the question is whether or not she's going to be the candidate she was at the end of the 2008 process or the candidate she was at the beginning of the 2008 process. The beginning of the 2008 process, she was stilted, contained, didn't relate to people, uh, assumed she already had the nomination and acted like it. When she got in trouble and had to go into states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Texas and really fight for it, she was a terrific candidate. She was really good on the stump. It didn't matter at that point because under the way the nominating rules worked and proportional representation, without a massive upset, there was, gonna, there was no way that she was going to beat Obama for the nomination. Uh, so I, I assume she will begin where she left off in 2008, but we'll see, maybe she's rusty. On the other hand, if she's gonna begin where she was then, uh, and begin where she was in 2007, beginning of 2008, a primary challenge is not gonna help her. It's gonna make things worse. It could actually weaken her a lot. Uh, on the Republican side, and we haven't talked about this, and I'm intrigued by it because I see Jeb Bush wrestling with this, I see even Scott Walker trying to wrestle with this. The Republican primary process has the potential, as it did last time, to push the Republican, ultimate Republican nominee to places that nominee does not want to go. Mitt Romney did not want to tell <coughs> 11 million Hispanics that they should self-deport. He did it because he was pressed and pressed and pressed in those primary debates. And I think the same thing could happen this time on the immigration issue, on the LGBT issues, which I think are really harmful to Republicans, not just because of, of lesbian and gay voters, but because of younger voters who think this is nutty. Uh, so I think there could be a lot of pressure on some of these Republicans, in, in fact, the eventual winner, to move to a place that's going to make it tougher to win a general. I can see Ted Cruz who came up, has come up with two things so far. One is constitutional amendment to outlaw marriage equality. And the other is a congressional bill to take away the Supreme Court's power to rule on equal rights for gay people, asking his opponents in the Iowa caucuses, which are very conservative, do you agree with me or not? And trying to push them. He hopes they disagree, then he gets the votes. But the tendency on the part of a lot of these guys is going to be, I may not believe this, but I have to go there because they have this basic rule. If you don't get nominated, you can't get elected. I'm going to put Bob down as undecided uh, on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. But let me answer one question to the, to the question, which I think is you know, one thing that a lot of people in politics have thought about for a long time. And the answer is there's no clear answer. And I'm just give you one example. The Obama-Clinton campaign in 2008 for the Democrat nomination, it's the closest and the longest primary election in history, not even close. The most expensive, the longest, and the closest. It didn't seem to do a thing in that way to stop him from becoming president of the United States or even running a full campaign or looking energized or uniting the Democrats. So my view is we have one example of a war that went to the, just about the last moment and yet 
the person who emerged doesn't seem to have been damaged. A lot of Republicans believe, and this and Bob alluded to this um, with the other stuff. Bob alluded to this, which was uh, a lot of Republicans believe that the campaign of 2012 that nominated Romney was too long, too difficult, and almost like a demolition derby. By the time the car got across the line, had a lot of dents and scratches in it. And so they're going to try to have a different uh, experience next year. We'll see if it works. Do we have any other questions? Maybe we'll see My favorite see if questioners at the yeah. front, but I... Uh, Anything about some of the issues you would like to see? Oh, one in the back? Okay. <laughs> we appreciate your concern. I was just wondering what you both thought about, or either one, um, that the candidates are gonna focus on f as far as educational reform. I know that that's a big buzzword right now with race to the top and no child left behind, both and then the new, the new national standards. So I'm wondering what you think they would focus on for this upcoming election. It's an excellent question, and, uh, and there's no doubt that it's going to come. I guess I'll make one point, which is I hope that you find our logic as blinding as we are finding the lights um, for us. But um, the, to the question, there is no, no doubt that the candidates will not only feel compelled to address education and you use the term education reform, they kind of go together almost. You know, one almost never talks about mm -hmm. one word without the other. So to me, we have sort of a built-in action item to it. I mean, Jeb Bush has often talked about, uh, you know, his view of schools and his uh, knowledge of it. But one thing I'll mention, you mentioned No Child Left Behind, that's correct, and Race the Top, and there's another one which is called Common Core. And I think that I've never seen an issue, or rarely seen an issue that has gripped so many primary voters who are activists and who are sort of uniformly negative, but at the same time, um, Bush, a nominal front runner, is embracing it to a large extent. So, and so what we have is not only addressing the education issue, but addressing it in a way from Bush's perspective where he thinks if I advocate something that a lot of people I'm trying to get from vote for me are opposed to, he will send other messages about reform but dovetailing from education reform in the first. Uh, I think Democrats will talk a lot about making college more affordable, uh, and I think that's a critical issue uh, that has to be addressed. And by the way, I don't think it can be done by saying middle class kids and lower middle class kids and poor kids can all learn online and rich kids can all go to SC or places like that. I mean, it has to be something that has in it a sense of egalitarianism that gives everybody the opportunity to go through the door. So I think they'll talk about that. I think on both sides, people are going to grapple with this whole notion of educational standards. We forget that this was a consensus issue in 2001, when No Child Left Behind was passed. It passed very easily. There was a belief that you had to set standards and hold teachers and schools somehow or other accountable. It has morphed, or you guys could tell me I'm wrong, it has morphed, at least in the minds of many, into endless test taking. And instead of teaching people courses, teaching people how to take tests. Now, how we get through that, how that's going to change, I don't know. I mean, the truth is that when you get to some charter schools, for example, they don't apply any of these standards. And the evidence is that charter schools, on the whole, don't have much better outcomes or have about the same outcomes as public schools. But all of that is going to be debated and debated very vigorously in the campaign. Can I just make one more point just real quickly on this, going from what Bob said? One reason why, and it's interesting that politicians talk about education, it's also what we call a value issue. You know, most of these guys are men or women, they're older, their children aren't in school, or my gosh, their grandchildren might not even be in school. So the fact is, when a candidate for office talks about education or schools, education reform, what they want that to mean besides their idea is because they're thinking about something in which they have no personal stake. My view is you know, their, their son or daughter's not going off to that school, they gotta fix it. They're not in it themselves. So to me, one message that gets sent, one inference that they wanna communicate is that they're thinking about, care about, and want to address and fix something that they themselves have no current point in and they want that to mean something because they do. It means they can care about things that don't affect them directly. 
So unfortunately, I think we do need to wrap up. I think although we'd love to sit here for the rest of the afternoon and talk politics. Um, so at this point, I'd like to thank both of our panelists. Mr. Everyone is going to put their hand up now that it's over. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Bob just bought us 10 more minutes. I'm going to go to 11. I'm, gonna, I'm oh, happy to the, do 11. Let's, let's ask the teachers in the room. Can we stay for a few more minutes, or do you, wanna, do you have to keep going? Oh, we have to get out of here. Goodbye. Okay. Have fun. <laughs> Enjoyed you. Wait, I have a couple of announcements. If you wouldn't mind, just a moment, please. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Let's, let's all join me in thanking Mr. Wilcox and Mr. Shrum. And... Uh, my, thank, my thanks to the USC Daily Trojan and Sarah Donna Patana, who are our co-sponsors for this series. <laughs> thanks to you all from the Santa Ana Unified School District. Thank you for being Yay. here. Yay. And, Yay. and just two more things for the campus folks who are in our audience. The deadline for our 2015 summer uh, political scholarships and awards has been extended to next Tuesday. So please get in your applications to us at the Unruh Institute by next Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Next Wednesday, we'll be hosting our final lunch discussion series of the semester in this building in the Ronald Tudor Campus Center 227 from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Free food will be served as always. And finally, our final roundtable discussion series of the semester will take place on... Uh, also on next Wednesday, April 15th in Mud Hall from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Enjoy your visit to USC.